Okay, welcome back everyone. We're here live at Percona Live. This is theCUBE, our flagship program. We go out to the events, extract the signal from the noise. I'm John Furrier, the founder of SiliconANGLE. I'm joined by co-host Jeff Frick with theCUBE. And our next guest is uh, Tim Callahan, Vice President of Engineering of Toku Tech. Is that right? Did I get that right? Toku Tech? Toku Tech. Toku Tech. Okay, depends how you want to word that. Welcome to theCUBE. Thanks for having me. So you're famous, internet famous, you and your brother, uh, we were talking online, your brother Mark Callahan works at Facebook, uh, your, uh, with your company, VP of Engineering. You guys are SQL geeks. Is that, would that be a fair statement? Uh, I think that's fair. You know, like <laughs> we looked at, in the past, there's always been this uh, East Coast, West Coast rivalry, so Celtics, Lakers, uh, Shaq and Kobe, and, uh, and Mark and, uh, and Tim. So tell us what's going on. So my Siegel House League, we are huge fans of open source is what we, we, we live and breed every day. It's been great innovation, but now we're involved in multiple stacks, integrated stacks, different philosophies, different religions, if you will, around you know, scale and development, uh, engineered systems, like what Oracle's doing to do you make it more open, scale out, open source, a lot of things, and a lot of software is going to be tying it together. But MySQL's been a big part of the success of a lot of startups, certainly Facebook you mentioned, your brother works at. Um, but everyone's talking about scale, right? And web scale SQL kind of points to this data first philosophy where companies have a data driven business model. Mm -hmm. That's the real time. What does that mean under the hood? So take us through what, what all those trends mean for the database under the hood. I, I think what's interesting and what we're seeing more and more at this show is just MySQL is, is an infrastructure and it's, uh, and it's open and something lots of people are building on top of. So, just within the expo floor itself, there's several companies uh, working on the scaling issues. There are several companies working on availability. Um, we're a, Toku Tech is a storage engine vendor, so we make a, an alternative to InnoDB to try to get better performance and compression um, without having to change any of your application whatsoever. And then you see lots of contribution in other ways as well. There's monitoring, uh, Vivid Cortex just launched. And uh, so MySQL is kind of at the center of all this, but there are lots of businesses and, and just open source activities going on to allow people to continue keep their data in MySQL without having to go to a new solution and improve it um, based on the efforts of others. Okay, so take us through in your mind um, from, a, from an industry standpoint and someone who's in the trenches and had a lot of experience, the trend from storage is, has been a big part of the supporting the lack of memory. Now mm -hmm. you have memory with persistence and flash, now non-volatile compression. You're seeing some expansion of that addressability. Mm -hmm. Now storage is the problem. So talk about how you guys play in that with the storage engine. What, what does this all mean? Like why, why is this a game changer? Why is it an opportunity? Why is it a challenge? Uh, it, it, it's actually interesting in, in multiple directions. So one is this move toward flash. Flash is fantastically fast, um, but it's costly. And not only is the cost per megabyte significantly higher than spinning disks, but the durability is, uh, is something you have to be concerned with. So uh, something very good about Toku Tech software is not only do we do compression, but we write uh, quite a bit less data to disks. I think uh, if you look at some of my uh, Mark's blogs recently, for example, he's focusing on not just how the size of a, of, of a workload on disk, but how many megabytes for a particular benchmark have been written to disk as well. And that's, the big key to Flash is not just it's more expensive, but how long will it last? And in the keynote today by Fusion IO, um, the other mention was one way that Flash is getting cheaper is just that it's it's not getting smaller, it's just getting less durable. So to, to bring that cost down, you have less writes, and uh, so cheaper Flash is going to wear out faster if you don't have a storage technology that just plain old writes less. Well, the durability is an interesting point. Let's drill on that for a second. A lot of people look at Flash and get enamored by it because on paper it looks good, right? Mm -hmm. But the durability is a big issue. So how do you guys manage that? So you guys have, the, you manage on the, between the storage piece and memory. What specifically is the key issue to manage the durability? Okay, the, the way we manage it is, uh, Tokotech was built on a, on a data structure called a fractal tree index. 
which is very different than a bee tree. And, and one of the goals of the, uh, of the fractal tree is we amortize many, many operations um, before we actually write something to disk. So on a, on a traditional bee tree, if your data doesn't fit in memory, when you put a row in a, in a table, you'll be writing to disk almost immediately. Whereas with a fractal tree, you might get 1,000 or 5,000 insert operations, for example, for one single write to disk. It's just, it's fundamentally very different um, in, in terms of how it interacts with storage. And part of the reason, you know, we've ended up in a flash world. Uh, the fractal tree index was created in a, in a world of spinning disks. Um, so the goal back then wasn't necessarily about durability, it was about the cost of an I.O. Uh, so now an I.O. has become free with Flash, although it's become expensive and, uh, and doesn't last forever. Yeah, so you guys kind of like, the world spun in your direction, so you built it for storage to make it more efficient. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden you become a key element in the Flash world, that's what you're saying? Yep. Yes. Okay, what are some of the examples you guys can point to out there where, where you've worked with customers and use cases that, that are highly optimized for what you guys call big data? Okay, uh, so insertion is, uh, speed is certainly a use case we see quite a bit. So in, in, in the world today we see gathering data from sensors, um, gathering data for dashboards, uh, network, uh, logging network traffic for example. Those are all high insertion, um, so we need to be absorbing the data quickly, but the data does need to be indexed as well because to just insert data into a database without being able to select it later is a problem. So we maintain indexes uh, at high rates of speed. Um, the other thing we do very well is compression. So we have a, uh, a couple of valuations and, and things going on right now where um, the, far, the, the highest compression I've ever seen is, is 20x compression. We actually have a, a user right now getting over 30 times compression. So they're building an appliance, and in that appliance, if they put a 200 uh, gigabyte hard drive with 30 times compression, it's behaving as if it were a six terabyte device. Talk about how the company got, uh, you said the fractal tree index is nice. Talk about how you guys got here how it was developed. Just tell a quick story about, this, story about the company. Okay, so fractal trees um, uh, were created by the founders, um, Martin, uh, Michael, and, and Bradley, um, back in 2008, 2000, uh, 2007 and 2008. And um, it was patented, and that technology um, has evolved into what we call TokuDB, uh, which is our MySQL product, as well as TokuMX, which is our MongoDB uh, product. And, and the initial concept um, and strategy um, got, got created, and then over time, the last six or seven years has gone into making it performant, giving it high compression, making it acid. Um, you know, it, it does have acid properties. It does have the ability, you know, it needs to be uh, durable, has to be able to recover from crashes and such. So many of those years have, have been just adding more features and functionality to the, to the basic technology. So Tim, you, uh, you gave a keynote here on benchmarking, I believe, right? I gave a presentation last year on benchmarking. Oh, on benchmarking. Okay, so it seems it seems uh, relatively straightforward and not something that people would have to be reminded about. So, what was kind of the focus of, of so kind of readdressing that was the a, benefits of benchmarking? That was a very a, a fun presentation for me. I've kind of been a lifelong benchmarker. It's something that's that's in my uh, my DNA, and I really like measuring things and making them faster. So, my proposal for last year uh, that got accepted was I wanted to try to take 20 years of benchmarking experience and turn it into a 50 minute presentation and really get the point across to people about some of the fundamentals that I think are often lost. And, and the biggest fundamental is to change one thing at a time. Like if, if, as soon as you introduce two variables into, into any benchmark, you have no idea which, which of those variables actually affected the performance of what you've just done. So you know, at, at TokuTech, we're small. Uh, we do frequent benchmarking just to make sure performance should always get better or stay the same and never go down. And with automation and benchmarking, you can accomplish those goals. So there were a lot of best practices in that talk. It was you know, kind of a beginner, intermediate, advanced section, so people could kind of, everyone could, could follow along, and at a certain point, people, I think, um, I was going well beyond what people would normally do for benchmarking. But I, I, I enjoy it a lot. I do all the benchmarking at, uh, at Toku Tech on our products, comparing us to MongoDB or comparing us to, uh, to InnoDB. Do you feel that as a skill has slipped a little bit in the age of, of agile and fast moving and run, 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 run? Um, I, I can describe it in a term that, that, uh, that Mark throws my way from time to time. He calls it uh, bench marketing. <laughs> and I try not to fall victim to that, but it is certainly possible. I mean, a anytime you see a vendor benchmarking their own software, you know, when is the last time you saw a vendor show you the benchmark where they lost to their competition? So, in benchmarking, it's often the practice, you, you, you might come up with eight benchmarks and you win six. Well, the six are the six you publish, the two are the, the ones you don't, and, and 
if someone else finds that in the wild, it's, you, know, you have to come out and talk about it. Um, I think it's important to talk about the use cases where your software works well and to admit where it doesn't because the last thing you want to do is have a, a user come in and try your software for the wrong reasons and get bad results. And uh, that doesn't help you as a company because when the user complains about it, it's actually going to be worse. Yeah, well, and hopefully and, you're benchmarking for your own performance and your own feedback loop as mm -hmm. opposed to benchmarking just purely for the sales effort. Yes. Where are the benchmarkings out there right now? I mean, obviously, benchmarking is definitely being done. It's been <laughs> it's been age, it's been going on for age. But now with crowdsourcing, Jeff, I mean, that's going to put uh, a wrinkle in that because now people are, can call out these benchmarks. So, but. We've seen the collapse of benchmarking. You don't see a lot of independent benchmarks anymore, either because no one can fund it or no one takes mm -hmm. it. So what do you? What are out there for benchmarking? Independent benchmark? Are there any? Um, there's some. So II Bench is, a, is an insertion benchmark that was created by Toku Tech and is actually now owned and maintained by Mark. Um, SysBench is a benchmark framework that is owned and uh, is maintained by Percona. TPCC has been around forever. Yeah. Um, you don't see a lot of that in the, in the MySQL arena, but it is certainly a way to just keep track of performance. Uh, I think the challenge right now is finding the place for, for benchmarkers to congregate and put their efforts together, because I think there's a lot of one-off benchmarks. Um, a twist, products. putting a twist on it, for instance, right? Someone might say, hey, yeah, this is a general purpose benchmark, but I want to uniquely put a use case in there, right? That's what you're referring to, right? Yeah, it would be great if someone somewhere could, could come up with a few uh, real world use cases we want to model, and then one or more vendors could participate in building the benchmark and, and, and modeling that. The challenge there is any vendor who feels like they're not going to do well in that benchmark is going to pull back and not contribute to the effort. Which, if you document that with live video and a crowd chat, then backing out is bad for them. <laughs> so, exactly. So, come on, people, let's get on that. Uh, we'll, we'll, Jeff, we'll get on that. We'll make sure we look at the benchmark. Well, too, like Gary said, uh, Gary Ornstein was on yesterday, that some of the benchmarks are changing. You know, what's relevant and, and how you're measuring performance is really changing. I think he talked about eBay now measuring web pages served per kilowatt. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as, as cloud gets more pervasive, as the data gets more pervasive, the actual things that people want to measure are changing out from underneath their feet. So I'm sure that adds an, an, another challenge to the whole thing. Yeah, and then there's what are you measuring in the benchmark. As I mentioned, you know, we're we're getting to a world with, with Flash where it's not just how small you are on disk, it's, it's how much data have you written to that device, and in the background, how much garbage collection has it performed. So that's an aspect of benchmarking. We can use all the existing benchmarks, rerun them, and not just look at speed or size on disk, but look at megabytes written, for example. Yeah, benchmarks are a challenge. Tim, I mean, we, 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 we'll get on that immediately. Uh, the Wikibon team will be on that. I got to ask you some more industry questions because I want to get your perspective because you know the database world is really hot right now, but it's been around for a long time. It goes through these cycles, you know, cube, seek, structured. It just seems to like something hot comes in, then structured comes back again. Something new comes in, then you got some sort of structured database never goes away, schema, etc. Uh, but looking at your website, you guys have customers in cloud enablement, social networks, e-commerce, data processing. I mean, it's almost like the modern era is the new wine, uh, old wine in a new bottle. Mm -hmm. as this expression goes. So, I mean, data processing is a term that kind of goes back to the mainframe, but it's really critical now. Real time, cloud is just infrastructure, social networks is just graphs and, and, and uh, date more data. What is the big uh, trend right now, and how can you compare this real time cloud social networks to a distributed networking computer science problem in the past? So, I mean, there's always comparisons with a twist. Could you, could you kind of dice it out for us. Is there any parallels to older older paradigms that are now rearing its head again? Okay. I think one way to look at that, or a way I look at it is, I worked at VoltDB for two years, uh, which is a Mike Stonebreaker company. And Mike Stonebreaker has Vertica, he has Columnar, yeah, the VoltDB. Whole columnar. So, so Mike's, um, you know, uh, one premise there is one size does not fit all. So let's build a, a database for in-memory computing, let's build a database for OLAP, um, let's, let's build these uh, search solution uh, what, what's interesting in the MySQL ecosystem is let's, let's try with one common foundation to make it do as many things as possible. And there's going to be edge cases that just don't fit. There, there are, are likely some use cases where Cassandra is the best technology for a given problem. But you could certainly extend MySQL to go a long way. You look at you know, Facebook, for example. Um, they're, not using, they're, they're doing all manual sharding. They're not using a, a, a sharding technology to get that done because they've, they've looked at the effort and they've mastered how to make it work for them. It's a very particular implementation. I don't think they would recommend you know, everyone in the world go, go in that direction, but you can make MySQL do uh, a lot of things and over time people just find out 
more ways to make it do interesting things or vendors come along or open source projects to extend the functionality further. So, uh, you know, I'm kind of a fan of this, let's make MySQL do uh, as many things as possible instead of thinking we need to cut a different version of MySQL to maybe handle the OLAP problem. Um, because, you know, if you look around at the MySQL, uh, in the MySQL market, there is no uh, open source OLAP solution. You know, there's, there's InfoBright and InfiniDB um, that, are, that are closed source commercial solutions, but no one's written a storage engine for, for OLAP. And, Maybe at some point that'll happen. I think, I think that would well, be that's an opportunity, right? So there's just two strategies. Do you have all these little siloed, like, use case built mm -hmm. structures? Or you go general purpose platform that enables people to do customization. Mm -hmm. That's pretty much what you're saying. That's the preferred approach yes. in your mind. Um, what about the companies that don't have the expertise like Facebook or, I mean, everyone wants to be the next Facebook. Well, I want to do what Facebook's doing. Well, guess what? You need talent. Mm -hmm. You need developers. Now, the good thing is MySQL's got hundreds of thousands of developers out there. So where's the developer community going to enable that, I don't want to say slow moving enterprise, but kind of a normal business, large enterprise, not Facebook, not Google, not the guys who actually can whip mm -hmm. up their own sharding <laughs> approach. Rooms full not of everyone PhDs. can do that. Not everyone can do that. Yeah, it, it's, it's a tough problem to solve. It's good to see Oracle uh, moving in the direction of making sharding easier with MySQL Fabric, for example. Uh, they announced it, uh, I think a year ago, there's uh, a couple of releases have gone out since then, so it's nice to see that they're trying to put something in the box. You know, I would argue something MongoDB did really well was they put um, sharding in the box, and they came out with their own implementation so people didn't have to do it themselves. You know, you, you, one might argue, you know, performance about MongoDB, you, you might come up with, uh, you might not like it, that it's a perfect solution, but it's there, and, and Oracle is coming along later and, and adding that feature and functionality, which I think is fantastic. That will hopefully push and inspire the uh, the commercial vendors who are doing sharding to to do better and to to work faster to stay ahead of that curve and kind of the competition um, makes everybody better. We with Tim Callahan, guru uh, in databases. The last couple of minutes we have here, I want to just drill into some of the trends around big data. So define big data from your perspective. Before we started, you gave me a good definition. I want to get that out there, but also want you to comment on this new data sources that are coming in. And, and, it's new data sources only because we're now connected with the Internet of Things. You've got sensors, surveillance networks, social networks. There's much more of a graph database. Non-SQL type databases are great for catching data that's unstructured. But mm -hmm. at the end of the day, it's got to connect in. So you have uh, real time. You have social networks. You have new data coming in that, quite frankly, you can't really prepare for in the old model, old mm -hmm. world. How do people deal with that? And, and what, what can they do, and what, is, what does that mean for the, the new guy making their architecture decisions? Okay. Um, as, as we talked bef before we started here, you know, my definition of big data is data um, that doesn't fit in RAM. So for, for a product like TokoDB, for example, uh, NODB is a fantastic engine, um, but once the data is larger than RAM, you'll be, lar you'll be um, gated in performance by your I.O. Um, so for us, you know, as soon as the data no longer fits in memory, uh, the product just keeps going and, and, and remains fast. Uh, the challenge with this big data problem is data is arriving quickly and it needs to be indexed uh, so people can do queries on it later. Um, so there's time series, there's data coming from sensors. Um, ingesting this data at high rates of speed, um, doing it on, on, a, on a reasonable number of servers, and then keeping the data indexed so you can answer the queries that your users have because it's, it's tragic to bring the data in and then not be able to query on it um, or have to to ingest it into MySQL just to push it out to something like Hadoop so you can run your reports um, in a non-real-time or a batch mode. Um, so, so we're seeing lots of, you know, the, the It's hard to put that genie back in the bottle once you ingest it in this, you said, tragic situation. You meaning you have data and you really can't work on it. Sure. Which causes some problems. What are some of those yeah, collateral and, damage? Well, the other challenge is, is kind of the rise of, of products like MongoDB. It's, I'm ingesting this data at high rates of speed. And, and the use case changes. So for example, in MySQL, I need to add a column. I, I need to, to start ingesting new data on an existing table. And if, if rewriting that table takes days, weeks, or months, it's an impossibility. So you take a product like Mongo that, that uh, doesn't have a schema change problem, and it just it's happy to ingest uh, rows of data that now have uh, a column that wasn't there before. So part of, in my mind, the rise of the NoSQL is that. It's about just complete flexibility on the schema and not having to anticipate every aspect of my use case to be really agile 
to just be able to upgrade my applications in the middle of the day on a Friday yeah. without worrying about downtime, having to put up a little message on the website saying, sorry, we're going to be down Saturday for an hour. Yeah, and that's, uh, that's an unrealistic, I mean, that's an un unacceptable situation. So that's a positive. But what's the negative of, of, of being too ingested or as Gil at Factual and I were talking about a couple weeks ago, being data full? I mean, at, point, at one point you're, def you're bloating with data, you're busting out with data. Is there an issue there? What's the consequence of that? Is there a consequence? There is one, and, and the one consequence is, you know, normally this data does have a, a life expectancy of usefulness. So in, in, ingesting high rates of speed means at some point you're likely having to remove that amount of data at that same rate of speed while still continuing to ingest at probably <laughs> a higher rate of speed. And, and that's the part people don't uh, oftentimes think about. It's the, I'm going to keep the data for six months, and it's arriving at a certain rate of speed. Well, when you hit the six months, the insertion speed is still exactly as it was or better if you're successful, um, but you need to build in for the ability to get rid of data. That's a really good point, and, and that's a mindset issue too. That's the old mindset of data warehouse business intelligence was, I'm going to store data, park it out in the backyard, and then we're going to run some algorithms, do some data mining on it, and poof, answers come out. Mm -hmm. Now, the lag is not big of an issue. What you're talking about is, you're talking about acting on data when you have a real-time inbound ingest that's complicating the hell out of it. A lot of it makes the data dirty. Mm -hmm. So how do people solve that problem? Uh, the common way to do that in MySQL is partitioning. So in MySQL, you, when you have these big tables that are going to ingest high rates of speed, you partition data by day, week, or month, and uh, it makes it very easy to remove old data in one simple operation instead of having to delete row by row. Well, this is a great conversation here. We're getting in the weeds. I love, love the MySQL relevance. is still continuing. The developers are out there. Tim, I want to ask you to share with the audience out there your perspective on, on, on why MySQL is still important, why is Percona Live such a great event, and what is the core conversations happening here on the ground at the event? Um, for, for me personally, it's the community. It, uh, I, I used to go to Oracle Open World for several years. Uh, just to, and I, I was an Oracle user, just a, a very different feeling. You walk around here, um, there's a lot of uh, enthusiasm, there's a lot of hiring going on by very big, interesting companies. Uh, at Toku Tech, we open sourced a year ago at the conference, and a year has now gone by, and I've got lots of people coming up to me telling me how they tried our software, what their experience was, that they plan on trying it, giving us um, ideas for features. Um, I did a birds of a feather session last night on extreme MySQL performance. My expectation was to have people standing up um, as Facebook lookalikes and telling me just how fast their systems were and have other people who would stand up and learn from them. Uh, but instead, the first person who raised his hand um, was, was just getting started in MySQL. And the best part about it was we kind of dissected every reason MySQL might be slow. So we still talked about extreme performance, but we picked it apart from a beginner level. And no one in the room was, was upset that this wasn't about you know, people thumping their chest about how fast their database It's an is. authentic community, what Absolutely. you're saying. It's not yeah. like grandstanding. Oracle Open World is about grandstanding, doing mm -hmm. deals. This is more of a develop. This is developers. Yes. This is all about developers. developers. And, and operations. Um, the developer market has changed. i got to ask you, with the cloud uh, more is going on here, you have everyone wants to win the developers. Uh, um, does that worry you a bit in terms of all the spam that could come in, a lot of the FUD, create poison the well, if you will, around the real move movement around what the developer community is. And second question is, what is the hot thing for developers right now? What do they really want? Uh, th that's interesting, and, and given that we span two technologies, we have a nice uh, NoSQL solution in, in the Mongo market and a MySQL solution. Um, your point about winning the hearts of developers, uh, yet, you know, yet another thing Mongo has done really well is they've, uh, they've created a product that a developer can just install and get started, and there's no database administrator. There, there's you know, there, there is need for operations and administration, but it's, it's different than having a, a formal release process where you have to add a column to a table, so you stage a release and you do it very formally, and you have checks and balances where in Mongo, uh, the developer can just change the schema on the fly and then uh, keep going, and I think um, Mongo has won the hearts of developers because of that. Um, there, there it's easy to been, use. It's easy to use, but there's always been a tension between developers and database administrators where a developer might want to make a change to a, a table schema and a DBA might look at that and kind of push back because they don't agree with it, where in Mongo there's no opportunity for that check and balance. Yeah. It's just here it comes and... and yeah, and that's, and that's powered in a lot of the DevOps mm -hmm. culture, which is infrastructure as code, which is a big part of its trend. Um, 
And that's good. The DBA and also you add the network guys and they got three levels of, you know, of hassle for the, well, two levels of hassle for the developer. DBA, which can be a, a, a bottleneck or a, a milestone, but now the network guy provisioning servers. Mm -hmm. With DevOps, how does that all change? And how does MySQL look at that DevOps view? Uh, it, it, that, that's a good question. So, you know, kind of comparing and contrasting to the, to the NoSQL model again, um, it, it lands in the laps of DevOps often with, uh, with um, like a MongoDB application, for example, where the, the app developer might have ch made a change and it's, um, there's no control between um, those changes actually making it into production. What's interesting in the MySQL world, again, this comes back to community, is there's lots of DevOps people here from lots of different companies, some of which you could actually con consider uh, competitive with each other all sharing information and ideas and making each other's lives easier, which is it's good for the community, uh, but it's an interesting world we live in where um, you know, Facebook is making many changes to, and, and make, creating many open source projects which are critical to their uh, success, yet they're open sourcing them and letting the world use them. Um, and I think their model is that the world will help make that product better and it's not, it's not worth keeping the code uh, locally and not sharing it. And you see that with WebScale SQL, you know, many of the bigger MySQL users contributing back to a common code. Final question before we break is, what do you think about Facebook's developer uh, outreach? They have this F8 conference coming up on April 30th. Uh, are they doing a good job? Are they targeting more app developers? What's your take on are you following that Facebook developer community? Uh, I am uh, um, kind of blown away uh, by how Facebook does development. There was a, uh, a few months ago, they, they opened an office in Boston for the first time. And I went, uh, they, they had an invite uh, only event. I went to it and they had, um, you know, it's partially about recruiting, but partially about explaining how they get work done. And they talked about their mobile development platform, and I think the number was uh, over 200 uh, developers at Facebook working on the phone apps. And they mentioned how every, every check-in was code reviewed by two engineers who didn't write the code within 10 minutes. And it's just stunning to me, um, that level of scale, and then how often they, f they push code to the phones. It was multiple times per day, releases were going out the door. So um, they've not only scaled in, in terms of headcount, but in terms of automation and testing and, uh, and just pushing things out. So I, I think they're doing uh, some really interesting things. And you think that's the, uh, a bellwether for the future? I, I think the, the iterating quickly, you know, putting software out there and, um, and improving and fixing things, you know, problems as they occur um, is critical for, for success, especially in, in mobile or, or social. Tim, thanks for sharing your perspective here inside the queue. We'd love to get uh, the, the data out of your head and share with the audience. MySQL is certainly very important. Performance, I mean, just it's just a game changer, and it's going to go to the next level. You're seeing things like Facebook and others leading the way. You guys are doing a great job with your storage engine. Thanks for joining us. We'll be right back with our next guest after this short break.